On today's Cold Boot, we're discussing the new AM5 socket from AMD, along with leaks of a potential power-hungry 170-watt chip. We'll also look at a report from The Verge backing up news from a previous Cold Boot on the GPU shortage and prices likely not falling anytime soon. Last on the docket is the first leaks on Intel's next, next generation of CPUs and new information on their upcoming dedicated graphics. Let's hit that power button. It's time to Cold Boot. On the first partition of today's episode, more details have surfaced regarding AMD's upcoming AM5 socket thanks to the folks at PC Gamer and a tweet from user TT Lexington. To be fair, we don't know yet that it'll be called AM5, but let's just run with that since it makes sense. While the socket is expected to be radically different from all previous consumer level AMD sockets using LGA like Intel does, according to new reports it may still be compatible with AM4 coolers. If being able to reuse the cooler pans out, that's definitely welcome news for existing AM4 users who'll be able to carry over their current cooling solution. Something they won't be able to carry over will be their DDR4 RAM, so it's a nice give and take kind of situation. Keep your $150 AIO liquid cooler and drop $250 on a kit of DDR5 RAM. Can't win them all. Probably the more exciting news from these reports is regarding the wattage specification leaked for the cooler design on the AM5 socket. This table shows anywhere from 45 watts to 170 watts. Does this mean we're going to see a 32 core, 64 thread, 6950X with 120 megabytes of 3D stacked V cache? No. No, it probably doesn't. Considering Zen 3 topped out at 105 watts, it's likely we won't see AMD make a 60% jump in power consumption at the top end. We're still basically a year away from any Zen 4 launch, and AMD could still be deciding what they want to do as far as power versus performance. I think ultimately it will come down to TSMC's N5 node. This is the process Zen 4 will be built on, and the process can very strongly dictate power draw. Let me put it this way. If AMD does release a monster 170 watt chip like the article suggests, that's probably not a good thing and says more about the N5 node than it does about the architecture or the performance of the chip. I think we're more likely to see Zen 4 top out at 105 watts again, or maybe jump to 125 watts. Let us know down in the comments what you're expecting to see. On the second partition of this week's Cold Boot, we're following up on some news that was originally discussed in episode 8 of Cold Boot about a month ago. According to a report from The Verge, on an earnings call this week, NVIDIA's CEO stated that he expects the GPU supply not to change much in 2022. This is an update from the last time NVIDIA spoke openly on this topic. Earlier this year, they stated that their expectation was that the supply would remain limited through 2021. I'm sure if you heard that news at the time, you thought, well, that sucks, but if I can just make it another few months, I'll be good. Well now, with Jensen's recent statements, that doesn't seem to be the case. Now there are a couple of items to unpack with this. First, NVIDIA is the only GPU maker that's currently using Samsung for their dye fabrication. This means this supply shortage through 2022 could only pertain to NVIDIA GPUs. After all, we do have Intel getting ready to join the GPU game shortly, and they're using TSMC for their manufacturing just like AMD does. But counter to that argument, I think all would agree, at least here in the US, AMD cards as of late have been much more difficult to acquire than NVIDIA cards. Does that mean TSMC is also struggling to keep up with demand? Well, it's no secret that's the case. They definitely are struggling to keep up with demand. But the reason AMD cards may be harder to get could boil down to how AMD has chosen to use their purchased wafer capacity from TSMC. Either way, I think the only glimmer of hope that we'll see some GPUs in stock at normal prices within the next year is if Intel can come in on their white horse and save us all. The reason I'm not hopeful about that, though, is because of what I just mentioned. Intel will be using the same fab as AMD. Good old TSMC. It is worth noting, however, that Intel's using TSMC's 6 nanometer node rather than the 7 nanometer node that AMD's Radeon division uses. So maybe that will help Intel produce GPUs in the kind of numbers they hope to and the kind of numbers gamers need in order to satisfy demand. At this point, we'll just have to wait and see how it all plays out. Let us know your thoughts down in the comments. Do you think we'll see GPU stock rising and prices falling within the next year? Speaking of Intel's GPUs and TSMC, new details were released this week regarding Team Blue's upcoming entry into the GPU market at their 2021 Architecture Day. 
First, I've already let the cat out of the bag in the previous partition. Intel will in fact be using TSMC's 6 nanometer node for their upcoming Alchemist GPU core architecture. As previously mentioned, this could be good news for supply since it's not having to share space with AMD on TSMC's 7 nanometer node. These new GPUs using the company's Alchemist core design will go to battle with NVIDIA's GeForce lineup and AMD's Radeon division using the name ARC. That's ARC with a C, not to be confused with Intel ARC using a K, which is Intel's massive online database for all of their products. ARC will come out swinging on a more advanced process node and with some upsampling technology just like we've seen from both NVIDIA and AMD over the last few years. Intel hopes their ZSS, or Z Super Sampling, will help gamers have a smoother experience rendering their games at a lower resolution and then upscaling them to a higher resolution via machine learning and AI. This means Intel is using an approach more similar to NVIDIA's DLSS, however they are hinting it will be cross-compatible unlike DLSS. This is good news because while AMD's FSR is also cross-compatible, it lacks some of the fancy tech like AI to get the upsampling done. This doesn't necessarily mean Intel's stab at it will function or look better, but it does mean gamers should have more choice, and more choice is always a good thing. At this year's Architecture Day, Intel had much more to say about their upcoming GPUs, but a good majority of it is very technical, and if we're honest, you'd probably be better served learning about the rest from someone like Steve at Gamers Nexus or Anantech's Ian Cutras. We'd highly recommend you go check those folks out if you want the nitty gritty on Intel's upcoming GPUs. On the final partition of today's episode, we have details on Intel's next generation, next next generation of CPUs thanks to Adored TV. We aren't talking about Intel's upcoming 12th generation Alder Lake chips here. We're skipping to my lucky number 13. Adored TV just released a video showing off Intel's new 13th generation Raptor Lake lineup in all its glory. These new Raptor Lake chips will build on Intel's new big little structure that will debut with the aforementioned Alder Lake chips later this year. This big little layout is something ARM has been using for a while now. It's used in almost all cell phone chips and may be most famous for its use in Apple's M1 SoC. Intel has decided to get into the big little game but using x86 architecture. Raptor Lake will employ a new performance or big core known as Raptor Cove. This will likely be an iteration of the upcoming Golden Cove design in Alder Lake. Raptor Lake will also make use of an enhanced Gracemont core for the power efficient or little portion of these chips. Raptor Lake will include the usual K SKUs as well as mainstream and low power variants. This scales all the way from a 2 core 35 watt chip to a 24 core chip using 125 watts. The 24 core isn't quite what you'd expect unless you're watching this video after Alder Lake is released. Rather than the usual X amount of cores and double that for threads using hyperthreading, all of these chips will get their full core count from adding the big and little cores together. This means the top end 24 core chip will include 8 big Raptor Cove cores and 16 little Gracemont enhanced cores, as well as 32 threads thanks to hyperthreading. It gets a little odd when you go down the stack though. The next chip will include 8 Raptor Cove cores and 8 Gracemont cores, but it'll have 24 threads. How's Intel getting their thread count? Oh, this is the part where you expected me to tell you why 16-core Raptor Lake has 24 threads? Well, this is awkward. I don't have a clue why it has 24 threads. If they're just using hyperthreading on the Raptor Cove cores, then that chip should have 16 threads. If they're using hyperthreading on all of the cores, then it should have 32 threads. Someone watching this that knows more than me, please comment below and let us know the formula Intel's using here. Now on to expected performance. I assume people who keep up with the latest hardware know that AMD has a 16 core 32 thread chip that's currently dominating Intel. Those same people are probably thinking Intel is in for a thrashing since they're coming to battle with a 24 core that only includes 8 performance cores and 16 puny power efficient cores. While that could be the case, it may not be. Let me explain why. So Intel's been boasting about their little Gracemont cores that'll be used in Alder Lake stating that they can be similar in performance to Intel's older Skylake architecture, but more power efficient with a performance delta, to paraphrase them. Remember earlier when I said Raptor Lake would be using enhanced Gracemont cores? So think of this new 24 core as having the best single core performance available, while also having some of the best multi-core performance per core out of the eight Raptor Cove cores. Then tack on an additional 16 low power Skylake Plus cores, 
then you'll roughly arrive at what's expected from Raptor Lake. That doesn't sound quite as one-sided. Well, it still could be one-sided. These are all just claims at this point, since no one has a CPU in their hands yet for independent testing. Additionally, keep in mind Intel is using their own fabs for production on Alder Lake and Raptor Lake CPUs, and we all know how power-hungry and hot their chips have ran over the last few years. So this still has the potential to go very sideways for Team Blue. It's all going to depend on whether or not the planets align perfectly. Will Intel be able to squeeze out the performance they believe they can? And will their process node be up to the task without sucking down so much power that you need the chips mainlined to a nuclear power facility? We should get an idea of which way this will go when Alder Lake releases. I'm not an Intel or AMD fanboy. I like whatever gives me the best performance for my budget, but I am rooting for Intel to pull this one off because competition is good for all of us. We don't want to end up in a situation like we were in when AMD released Bulldozer. Let us know your thoughts down in the comments on whether or not you think Intel can be competitive with their new big little strategy. We're interested to see what others think about the direction Intel's headed. And that's going to do it for this week's episode. If you enjoyed this video, please go AM5 170 watts on that like button. Consider subscribing if you aren't already, and don't forget to click the bell icon so you're notified when our next video goes live. We appreciate you watching, and we will see you in the next one.